Good afternoon, everybody. How are you? How are you? Uh, some teeth falling out there. How is everybody? I hope we're okay. Hope we're all well. Thank you for joining us today for our um, our penultimate webinar. Um, why employ ex offenders? It'd be grateful if you can give me a quick uh, shout out to let me know that you can see and hear me okay. It's always useful. Lots of goodwill in the chat there. I love that. I love that when people come in and just say hello. So that's always really, really nice. So I'm hoping that you can all see and hear me okay. <coughs> Let's see how we get on. We'll be starting in just a couple more minutes, just waiting for a few more people to come in. That's good. Thank you, Joanna. You can see and hear me. That's good. Thank you. That's great. Brilliant. Hi, Paul. Thank you very much for joining us today. It's, it's really good. Um, there's re people's names that I recognise from several webinars, so that's nice. So that's really good. Hi, Susan. Hi, Aaron. Kelsey, hello. I'm feeling bad here. There's a lot of people coming in. I'm not able to name everybody all at once, but as long as you can hear me, that's great. Thanks for letting me know, Lorraine. That's brilliant. So if you've um, not been on any of our webinars before, um, or maybe you've just been on a couple of the ones which are on Teams, and um, we have a platform here that we call Webinar Jam. So this is like a web-based platform. Um, so we've run the webinars this week, a mixture of teams, because we know that some organizations prefer that. And we've run some org and we've run some webinars on Webinar Jam, which is like a, a web-based platform. So hopefully everything should be okay with you. And um, what we do with Webinar Jam is a little bit different to teams. So if you want to make a comment, you've got any questions, just pop it in the chat. That's how we work on this one. Um, so it's a little bit different. It's the, uh, it's like I say, it's a little bit uh, more directive, arguably, than, than Zoom is or Teams. But like I say, you can just join it from a, a, a link on your website. So that should be OK. So let's get a move in, I think. So hopefully you've um, all signed up for this webinar and why employ ex-offenders. Just a reminder as well that today's webinar is being recorded. And what we'll be doing uh, next week, we'll be uploading all our videos onto YouTube um, so for you to enjoy in the comfort of your own pyjamas. Apologies if you're on the webinar this morning when I use the same line, but it just kind of seems to sum it up. Um, and we think that's quite useful because um, it's it, it's a great way to um, to share the message really of what we're trying to do with Inside Out Support Wales. So we'll get going now. So why employ ex-offenders? So it's a slightly... Um, a provocative title in a way, you know, why employ ex-offenders, you know, in other words, you know, why bother? Um, but actually, I'm trying to flip it on its head, um, as you'd imagine, because of the nature of our organisation. So I present a couple of things here, really, which basically suggest that people with convictions can make better potential employees. Um, I started to run this webinar probably about 12 months ago now, um, beginning of what, sort of like last spring going into summer. Um, when Inside Out Support Wales, like a lot of us, a lot of our organisations, was on hold for a period of time. So um, uh, it was just out there, really. I tried to sort of push it towards business. And there are some messages here that will be useful for business. Hopefully, they will be useful for you if you are working, maybe you're a partnership officer and you're building links with uh, businesses and what have you, and you want to try and um, maybe dispel some of the myths about recruiting ex-offenders. Um, and I can give you some good pointers there. Also, just to let you know that there are some things in here, maybe if you work in a prison already, or if you work um, you know, as a support worker with people who come straight out of prison, you might know some of the things on here. Similarly, if you've got um, lived experience of the criminal justice system, you'll know some of the things that are on here, but maybe some of the business benefits will be advantageous to you. So hopefully that is all good to go. So let's have a look, see where we are. So we've got loads of people in, so that's great. Good to see all the numbers, that's great. Hi, Mark, good to see you. Um, okay, here we go, let's get going. So what I would like to do, really, I would like to use the chat. So um, uh, if you could, just use the chat function. Let me know what you want to get from this little webinar. And we'll make sure that I've got all these bits and pieces included in the webinar. So what would you like me to talk about? I must explain, don't worry, I have got things to talk about. <laughs> it's not sort of a, a free form webinar. So if there's things that you want me to address, let's pop them in the in the chat, please. And I'll look to address them as we go through. We've got lots and lots of 
of pointers and we've got a short presentation, some films and some good handouts as well to drop in with you. So uh, what would you like to get from this particular webinar? So let's see, what do people want to get from today? Maybe you're just thinking, you know, I haven't even had my lunch yet. I want this to be uh, over and done and dusted. What we tend to find with these webinars is that when we run them, uh, people want to get um, a bit of practical um, advice, a bit of um, some resources potentially, or maybe people just want to sort of have a bit of a general introduction to the field of, uh, of, of sort of criminal justice and support. So yeah, how employers can overcome prejudices to people with convictions. Yeah, I've got some bits and pieces on that, which is good. Any of you to support participants with criminal records into employment from Lorraine? Yeah, definitely got you some good stuff on there. I've got some things that I think are useful to uh, maybe tell your clients, you know, tell the people that refer to you. Look, you know, you actually you've got some things going for you, which is good. Um, advice and signposting from Joanne. Um, yeah, definitely got that. Um, helping them to move forward with life, definitely. Hi, Philippa. Oh, wow, yes, running a pilot here to listen and learn. Brilliant. Um, how you can best support scholars who have done a degree. Yeah, we've got some good stuff on that as well, which is useful. Aaron wants to know about um, encouraging ex-offenders to apply for employment and pursue self-employment. Yeah, um, we've had a few this week all about self-employment. So if you didn't join the previous ones, although I think you did, Aaron, hopefully when we upload our films online, you'll be able to see some bits and pieces there. Um, the good thing is all the things that you've talked about in terms of what you'd like to get from today's webinar are here. Um, we should, we, you know, we'll probably take about, I don't know, an hour and 15 minutes, an hour and 10 minutes to see how we get on. Um, always happy to take questions in the chat. So feel free to pop stuff in there as and when it comes into your head. You know what it's like sometimes you think of a good question, you think I'll save it to the end. Um, and then the dog barks or uh, the kettle boils and then we forget what we we're going to ask. So just pop stuff in the chat as we go along and I'll make sure that I address it all. OK, so thank you very much for explaining that. OK, so what I'm going to try and do today, just give you a couple of aims from this particular webinar. I want to try and explain to you some of the business benefits of employing ex-offenders. And ultimately, I want you to be more confident in supporting people with convictions. Um, I'll try and help you understand what you could consider when employing ex-offenders. So, you know, um, what the business person is thinking about. Um, there's some bits and pieces about... Um, uh, some bits and pieces about how you can work with prisons and other organisations to offer employment and work placements. I've got some good examples of good practice and innovation straight from the Ministry of Justice, I, I must say. They sent me a, um, I think it was supposed to be polite, but actually actually, it was, it was a little bit curt, a little bit snotty, saying, I hope you're mentioning this, I hope you're saying this. So I make sure that I put that example. In. So they gave me a sort of um, an email version of a smack across the wrist, although they hadn't really seen the webinar and those, some of those things were already in there. Um, it's also, as I always say, it's a safe space for discussion. So if someone talks about something in the chat, please respect that, 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 that someone has been brave enough to talk about their own experiences or the experiences of someone close to them. So please do respect that. Um, we've not really had any issues yet with any of our webinars, um, but I'm always keen to include that little sentence because I think it's an important sentiment that we all hold up, not that we all hold dear. OK, let's see what we've got on there in the chat. I saw a couple of things in. Aaron, um, who will employ me with this record, et cetera? Many do say that. That's true. I'd encourage you, Aaron, to, I'd encourage you, Aaron, to sign up for tomorrow for the, um, for the uh, Positive Disclosure Workshop. It's not called that. I keep forgetting the name of it now. What's it called tomorrow morning? Effective Disclosure. Um, we've got some good stuff on there that we can potentially turn some of those negatives into a positive. Um, so that'll be good. Get to know some employers who are open-minded. I've got some pointers specifically on that, Philippa, which I hope will help you. And um, I've got some job tips which will help you narrow a person's search down rather than just sort of providing a bit of a scattergun approach, which sometimes people are encouraged to, you know, apply for anything. If you've got to, if you, if your, if your benefits um, rely upon you um, applying for work, you'll just apply for anything and not necessarily be a bit more strategic. So there we go. All right. Let's move on. So um, what I will say to you today is I'm not going to give you the answer to everything, every person, every case, but hopefully it will give you some good signposts. Um, I always, whenever I do the webinar jams, um, webinars, I always put a lot of links at the end 
so you'd be able to um, you'll get a handout of all these of, of the slides and um, a load of links different pdfs so you'd be able to you know search for those bits and pieces of resources and links and add infinitum as you wish um, I would say I'm not an expert in sentencing court appeals and processes. I've read a lot of books. <laughs> um, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not legally trained. But the information that I provide through this webinar is, you know, I have done um, quite a bit of training in this particular field. I'm director of a social enterprise. Um, I've got a lot of experience that I've built up over the time from working in this particular field. So hopefully a lot of the information that I provide you is based on real experience um, I'm no gatekeeper of information, so anything I, I provide with you to, uh, for you today is freely available after this. So it's not behind any kind of paywalls or membership, whatever. Hopefully, um, through what we get from, from what we get from doing these particular webinars, we, we sort of almost build like a community of practice. So I hope that um, you know you'll be uh, you know seeking out maybe some of the individuals here, and if you um, are trying to offer support in a particular field, feel free to contact us because you know that someone else is doing it and we'll uh, put you in contact with that with that other person who's offering a similar area of support to your good selves. So I'll mention what you'll get from this webinar. You'll get a copy of all the slides, tons of links for information. I've got I've got um, three films. Um, there might actually be four on the, uh, on the slides that you get. Three of them are good, one's not so good. Um, but you'll get the links to all those films, which are quite useful if you're if you're cascading this information down to other people. You can use this info. Um, this webinar is automatically recorded. You'll get your own private copy, um, which is nice. But also, we will be uploading them onto onto YouTube in uh, probably hopefully next week, which should be good. I always talk about us offering uh, peer support and professional support from Inside Out Support Wales. I put IOSW. We've got quite a long name. I wish we'd given ourselves a shorter name now when we found it, when we found it ourselves, but never mind. And um, so I, I get emails all the time. So just feel free to drop an email if you have anything you, anything you want to know. And if we don't know, we'll signpost you to people who do. I myself have done that today. Someone asked me for some support. I've, signed, I've um, been contacting Bryn at Clinks, who's given me some great pointers. So we are always happy to sort of network in that way. And ultimately, I want to give you a good, broad overview of how to offer additional support to someone with a conviction. That's what today is all about. So I'm going to talk to you a bit about the business benefits, first of all. So, yeah, there's business benefits to employing uh, people with convictions. So we are based in Wales. And um, when you look at the, um, the skills shortages in the past year, now when I say the past year, Obviously, the coronavirus has been, <laughs> if, you've, if you've heard of that, has been a significant impact in our work. So some of the data that we use in here is probably going to be out of date in the next few months. But I've tried to make sure that all the information I provide to you is as up to date as I currently can. But obviously, we're in a, we're in a period of flux right now. So half of the organisations in England and Wales have said they've struggled to find positions due to skill shortages in the past. But... Um, working with prisons, for example, there are employment opportunities which offer good business sense and they also help um, people with convictions and um, ex-offenders to get their lives back on track. Um, there's a lot of skills uh, that are available to people with convictions. The introduction to supporting people with a criminal record webinar that I did a couple of days ago talked about that, you know, networking skills and ability to excuse me, that's a bit ability to sort of like, you know, develop relationships, ability to sell a product, ability to problem solve, ability to identify uh, a profit margin. You know, all these sort of things are, are particularly important. Also, there's a lot of focus with a lot of people when they come out of prison. The webinar that we did this morning about building your personal brand um, talked about that focus that you see from a lot of individuals when they're in prison. You know, they're almost like a like a bottle of fizzy pop um, ready to get out of prison. You know, the ones who think, right, I'm never coming back in again. I, I know I've got a plan and I want to do it. Often it's some of the other things that might get in the way, but they come out of prison quite often with a really strong growth mindset. They know exactly what they want to do. Um, so what you can do as well when you look at the business benefits, um, 
I've put a figure down there. This is kind of almost like a, you know, a, a, um, a calculated figure of how much it costs to fill a non managerial vacancy. I've actually seen that figure increased in the last uh, month. I've seen it estimated to be about £3,000. Um, so what you find is that people who are ex-offenders when they get an employment opportunity and they go and work for a company, quite often there's a set of values that that company holds, which means that they're going to give people with convictions a fair crack of the whip. So there's a there's a synergy of values there between the corporate value and the personal value of the person wanting to get into work. So what you're doing then is you're you're, you're tying those two values together. So there's a low turnover, a lower turnover of staff when people get into employment. You often find that people with convictions when they've got that employment opportunity, you know, they are. I don't want to sound so grateful because that's a, that could sound condescending and patronising. Of course, that's certainly not my intention. But what you find is that people know that they have got a good opportunity there. They feel an affinity to the organisation, those values, again, that I talked about, and they're more likely to want to stay with that organisation. Um, there's various inclusive work opportunities, uh, work initiative, you know, op opening recruitment up to ex-offenders. Where I'm from in the uh, Democratic Republic of Preston in Lancashire, there's a really good project up there called Recycling Lives. Uh, and that's a prison, uh, that's a, pro a recycling project run out of HMP Kirkham, an open prison. Um, so men are able to go and work there pre-release, continue to work there afterwards. Um, and it's it's that kind of like supportive pathway that people are getting into employment. Um, you know, but and by having a, 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 you know a, a system where people are coming in who are ex-offenders and reducing that that cost of the turnover two thousand or three thousand each time. You know, you're reducing those overheads. You so essentially you're saving the business money each time they don't have to recruit someone. I, I I've worked in a couple of places where actually they want a higher staff turnover, and invariably those companies, you know, they um you end up sort of like scrimping and scraping sometimes because they're like I say they're having to spend two thousand to three thousand pound every time they've got to recruit an individual. Um, I mentioned that about the st sort of staff retention side of things. Um, Eighty-one percent of businesses say that ex, ex offenders have helped their business. Okay, so they're more liable to stay in, in employment. Um, they've often got um, higher resilience skills. They have got higher levels of loyalty and retention in that company. They've also got a level of institutional knowledge that's kept within that company. So you're not getting someone who is working up to a level and then leaving and then someone's got to be retrained because they stay within that organisation. They've got that institutional knowledge of the organisation, which is particularly important um, if other people are coming in and you've got someone there who can show them the ropes of how they can fit in. Um, that information there that I discovered from it in, a, in a report from Oxford Spencer, you know, that higher value that people play that people place on having a job, that desire to stay in prison, that often means that, you know, the people that work in places like Marks and Spencer's, that does not say that everyone in Marks and Spencer has a conviction, I need to add that caveat there, but when you've got an inclusive employer, um, that, you know, you don't get people moving out of the organisation as much. They want to stay within that organisation. Uh, they see it more as a career rather than a job, which I think is important. And ultimately, it's about trying to reduce staff absence. So the biggest concern that employers might have about hiring ex-offenders is they might not be honest or trustworthy. So they're concerned about that. Um, I've not seen any report or found a great deal of evidence to say that that's the case. You might get a few, uh, what do you call it? Um, you might get a few uh, sort of, you know, negative news stories sometimes, but, you know, Bad news sells quite often, so we don't often hear about employers having difficulties where um, uh, ex-offenders are not honest or trustworthy. In fact, I was in an organisation recently where we'd previously, from Inside Out Support Wales, we'd supported a person to get into work there. Unfortunately, they've gone back into prison um, on a recall, um, and the manager that I spoke to, rather than being, um, uh, I don't know, you know, rather than seeing the experience as being an incredibly negative, incredibly negative experience, that person going back in, they recognised that the pandemic had had a significant role to play in this person's experience. 
because they've been on furlough for quite a while, all that positive credit that they've built up, all those positive relationships, you know, in that work environment, unfortunately, haven't been in place for about nine months for this individual. So um, they were sympathetic to the individual and they hope to see them again in the future. So, and, and as we know, if you've studied any kind of theory of change, sometimes relapse is a part of that cycle of change as well. Um, what I've seen as well is that half of employers of ex offenders, they definitely positively rate their attendance at work. They talk about them being motivated and they talk about them being um, reliable too. So I think that's particularly important. So I'm going to share with you a little film now. Um, and this is a gentleman called Tyler. And he's going to talk about his work experience in uh, Green King. So I will share with you this video and then we'll capture with you on the other side. Sometimes I do think about what I would be doing, being in the wrong place at the wrong time, or, or even just going back to where I used to live and the people who I used to be involved with before. My mum, she's proud of me that I've moved out of the way and I'm always working. I don't get much time to see him all the time, but I know I'm doing a good thing. I'm Tyler McCarran. I'm doing my level two catering qualification at Dog and Partridge in Bury St Edmunds. Before I went to prison, I had a different point of view. My mindset was wrong. I used to be in antidepressants. But while I was in there, it's not just serving your time, you've got to think about your future. I knew I had to change my mindset and the way I think. Now when I go to work, I'm motivated every day. I'm happy doing it, so I think positively. And I use that motivation to be good as part of a team, be reliable and do good things for other people as well, you know. My relationship with Tyler, we, we get on very well, he's very approachable, he's very hard work and he's always reliable, his presentation is fantastic, he does help lift the team. We're willing to hire ex-defenders because they get a lot of experience on the inside anyway, so they've already come with a lot of job skills. A lot of the time they're more loyal to you, they want it that little bit extra because at some point they've felt that maybe they haven't got that second chance to make something of themselves. When I come out, I did have the fear of people not employing me. You know, you get nervous. People fall back into doing the same criminal activity because they're not occupied. Being on this Green King scheme, it has given me confidence. I've shown myself that I can work to the highest level. And it kind of changed my life because I eat healthy now. I don't smoke anymore. I don't take my antidepressants. I wake up every day positive, I'm a hard worker, I've always pulled through and uh, I'm, I'm better than ever. I feel like I'm on top of the world. There we go, that's Tyler's story with Green King. Um, I quite like that story. Um, I think it's quite straightforward. You know, it acknowledges that people have uh, you know, had a bit of a tough time. And it's there's a couple of things I think it's worth thinking about there. You know, you've got an individual there who's studying. So they're looking to get a level two qualification, which is important. And what you've also got then is you've got um, someone who talks about the past, about not making the right decisions. And they realise now they've got a chance. Talks about his mum, about not letting his mum down. If you joined us this morning, we were talking about... Um, how you behave on social media, you know, I think, what would your mum say? Because like mums are a constant theme in this, um, in, in our voices of experience webinar. Um, but I think, that's, I think that's particularly important, you know, the way that, that, that Tyler's talking about that. You can tell it really what it means to him. And you can tell that Green King and his work colleagues are impressed with him. I think the other, the, the sort of subtext of that as well is um, he talks about his friends previously and, and how things weren't so good then. And then he's talking about his work now as well. He's changed his peer group. That's what's happened there. He's changed his peer group. He's around professionals. He's around a busy working environment. Clearly, anyone who's worked in a pub before, you know, you rarely get time to uh, to socialise outside of the pub because it's usually pretty full on. So I like that story from from uh, uh, from Tyler and from Green King. You know, um, he's doing well there. And I think so. I think you know, little films like that can remind us of um, of how it can work well. And I think it's important to share those sort of experiences. Okay. 
So one of the reasons I use um, examples like Tyler's um, is this statement here from a gentleman called Tim, uh, Tim Wagner. Now, Tim um, lives in Cardiff, same as, same as where I am, South Wales. Um, and I asked him, I, he, I met him, like all good conversations, uh, I met him in a pub when we got talking about things. And he told me about where he worked. He works, he manages a couple of companies. And um, out of the blue, he told me that he regularly employs people who's come, who have come straight out of prison. So I'll read that for you in case you're on a small screen. Um, I've taken a few lads on who have previously been inside. Some have left and some are still with me. One's progressed to maintenance foreman and he's doing an, an exceptional job. I found that most ex-offenders to be hard, loyal working guys, eager to impress and make up for lost time. In some cases, their experiences in jail have helped that build their resilience to problems they may come across. As a manager, a bit of understanding and patience is well worth the rewards of the respect and support you get in return. So you've got there, you know, uh, Tim, he's a business owner. He sees the benefits of recruiting ex-offenders. And, you know, just simply what he's put there, you know, he's found people to be very loyal and very hardworking. So I mentioned about that staff retention issue there. You're not hemorrhaging 2,000 or 3,000 pounds every time you've got to recruit someone. They want to stay with you for a longer time. They're eager to keep. They're eager to impress. So they, you know, they're they're good learners. They want to make up for the lost time. They've got additional resilient skills, and, and God knows we need a lot of those right now. You know, with the pandemic and how we adjust to local lockdowns or, you know, further lockdowns or just you know the easing of restrictions. You need those resilient skills. Why is that important? Well, resilient skills are a soft skill or a transferable skill. So if you've got resilient skills from maybe your time inside, those skills are directly apl applicable to in being in the workplace. And those sort of soft skills are really what businesses really want. You know, they want problem solvers. That's what they want. So, you know, you've got these individuals, they've got resilient skills. They're going to be really, really uh, motivated and they're going to be able to deal with the stresses and strains that come sometimes from a busy work environment. Because, you know, I, I, I you know, there's not much... Not, not much uh, more uh, fraught and anxiety inducing than being locked away for a period of time away from your family and friends, especially if it was sudden. If they've managed to come through that, they've got a heck of a set of resilient skills. And those resilient skills are valued by employers. And as Tim says there, you know, it's a little bit of a, of a um, you know, quid pro quo there. You know, the, you, the manager needs to have a little bit of understanding and a little bit of patience. I'm going to come on to what in a minute. But if you if the manager exudes that patience and understanding, um, then it's well worth their you know their time because of the the reward of the respect that you're going to get in return. Hopefully, there's been a lot of talk online about you know it, maybe you know the world being a little bit kinder because we've all had challenges that we've had to overcome the last few months and um, the last year with the pandemic. And there are times when um, you know online hate particularly raises its head, but Sometimes, you know, these symbols of patience and respect and understanding um, are, you know, are, are noted and, and are acted upon. So that's an example of it. And I really like, I really like Tim's example of what he describes there. So also um, employees, you know, they can make a difference. So um, think about the social corporate, uh, sorry, the corporate social responsibility, the CSR. OK, so you've got things like, you know, two fifths of employees they're saying ex-offenders have helped their company to become socially responsible. It's a very clear way that you're showing that you are inclusive as an employee. Hiring former prisoners can be proven to reduce reoffending, most definitely. Um, you know, the I think the, the statistics are about 44% for people reoffending that come out. And that's drastically reduced when you have people who are going out and getting into work straight from release. So that's definitely true. Yeah. Um, I've just seen Joanne's message then as well. Yeah, a lot of people haven't had that routine before going into prison. That's true. You know, prison is very much very regimented life, isn't it? So sometimes, you know, the the, um, the uh, time and the hours that you keep in that routine that you get yourself into is directly applicable to going into work. So I think that's true. And as I mentioned there on the slide, the bottom one, then most offenders want the opportunity to turn their backs on crime. Having a job helps them get their lives back on track. People grow up, you know, I often talk about this in, in, in some of the other webinars and certainly tomorrow, you know, about 
painting a, pit, a picture to potentially an employer of what you are, of what that employer is seeing across the table. You are not the person from back in the day, um, you know, that was hanging out with the wrong crowd and getting into trouble and, and, um, and getting a conviction and serving time. You know, it's all about presenting the, the positive example to an employer about the training that you have done, the employment that you've done, so maybe some other volunteering, all those kind of things. Um, I, have a, I have a framework that I'm going to be talking about tomorrow, um, CODC, which is about circumstances, ownership, development and change. That's all about what you could show to a potential employer. Um, people grow up as well. You know, sometimes people have had to grow up when they're in prison. So that's that can be something that they can show to a potential employer. An employer, you know, will, make, will um, take a punt on them, put them in put them in post, and they can really help them to make a difference. So I think that's quite important. Think about what the businesses have to consider. Um, okay, sorry, what? Sorry, my mistake. Sorry. Um, if you're going to be working with ex-offenders, there are things that you have to consider and what the employers should be um, should be considering. OK, so I talk about this here. No prison can operate without prisoners. So people might think, well, of course it can't because who are you going to lock up? But prisoners do jobs in jail. So you've got cleaners, you've got kitchen staff, you've got education orderlies, you've got gym orderlies. You know, most jobs in prison, with the exception of uh, locking people up, um, are done by prisoners. You know, there's loads of opportunity then and then when you go to an open prison about half the population of any open prison will go out and work during the day so there are great opportunities there for those ex-offenders to say while I've been in prison I haven't just been sort of sat in my cell for 23 hours a day and doing nothing what I've actually been doing is I've been educating myself or I've been volunteering here in a stage one placement or I've been working on a stage two role job or you know, I've been working as a gym orderly or whatever, stuff that you can put down. Also, you can evidence your qualifications. It's all stuff that you can stick on a CV that you can put on a job application to show a potential employer that you know, you're know you worth um, employing, most definitely. Um, also in prison, as I'm sure several of you know, there are a ton of different prison industries. You know, everything from um, sort of, you know, bike repairing in HMP Cardiff to, um, uh, or, uh, or um, what's the past, the, the, the um, Bad Boy Bakery in HMP Brixton, Cracking Cakes. Um, you know, there's all kinds of little industries that are operating in prisons. Um, I would tell you the time when I tried to smuggle some uh, Bad Boy Cakes out of HMP Brixton and got caught by security doing that and, and that and got into trouble, but that's a whole different webinar. Uh, but everything ended up all right. So there's loads of different industries inside that you can utilize to give people qualifications and can go on and train when they come outside. Everything from decorating, bicycle repair, industrial cleaning, tons and tons of stuff. Those qualifications that people get don't say HMP Cardiff on HMP Swale side, wherever it is, they've got the degree awarding body or the qualification awarding body on there. Why is that important? Because a qualification gained in this part of the country, in this place, is just as valid right across the other side of the country in that place. They're both, um, you know, assessed to make sure that they've got the same standard of learning. But think about this. Only a fifth of the prison leavers have a job to go to upon release. It's actually one of the reasons why we um, decided to set up Inside Out Support Wales. You know, we recognise that sometimes there aren't always jobs there, so why not think about self-employment? When working with um, people who come out of prison, uh, especially um, recent prison leavers, businesses need to think about a couple of things. So one of the things that hopefully is addressed in the prison, but sometimes isn't we know about, is, is issues around literacy. So I think everyone in prison is supposed to be coming out with a level two English and maths qualification. But if people have got poor literacy to start off with, then their literacy levels aren't always great. I've known a couple of individuals who I suspected haven't got the greatest um, sort of um, written literacy skills. They're, you know, they're fantastic in terms of conversation and they can understand the stuff and they've got a great ability to retain facts and figures, but they can't, you know, when I ask them to write stuff down or maybe use a computer, we're coming up against barriers there. So literacy skills need to be considered, okay, making sure that people understand stuff. Also, um, people need to think about 
um, mental health needs of people coming out of prison. It's an age old debate, you know, does prison cause mental health problems or do people have mental health issues as part of one of the reasons why they might end up getting a conviction? Discuss. Um, but certainly I meet a lot of people who have had from low to higher level uh, mental health issues, mental health challenges when they're coming out of prison. Um, certainly, you know, from some of the times and some of the experiences I've seen in prisons, and I've certainly not seen anywhere near as much as other people, I've seen some stressful occasions as well. Um, so we need to be aware of people's mental health, you know, positive mental health support when people are released. And like I say, it's generally thought to be higher amongst females than males. Uh, people may have appointments, so they may have um, social worker appointments or they may have probation appointments. So I think that needs to be taken into account because you don't want people missing those appointments because then probation might get a bit twitchy and say, where are you? And then there may well be people who would be potentially breaching the terms of their license. So you need to make sure as an employer that people are aware that you know that your um, new employee might have some appointments that they might have to take. They may not have formally worked for a period of time, or if they have worked, they may have worked in a prison. Um, and sometimes the working environment in prison isn't the same as a working environment on the outside. So they might need a certain a bit of time to adjust with that sort of process. They won't also just be adjusting to um, a new job when they come out. They're also going to be adjusting to all kinds of other changes, especially if they've been in for a while. So they, could try, they might have to try and get their housing sorted. And of course, you know, we try and get that done beforehand. But sometimes there might be in temporary accommodation and their, um, and their uh, address, their home address may, may change a couple of times before they get a little bit more settled. They may be reconnecting with family and with friends. Um, and what that means, you know, they may well have, uh, you know, have, have a great deal of work there to try and make those connections back. They may not have seen children for a while. All the sort of things that maybe other people might take for granted um, has been taken away from some individuals because they had lost their liberty for a period of time because of the conviction. There can be other things as well. You know, I, I mentioned there about mental health, but also, you, you know, you might have people who maybe have AA meetings or maybe have got drug support meetings, just sort of checking in um, with the support workers. So there are those sort of support needs that need to be taken into account. And also, of course, any license restrictions. Um, you know, some people come out of prison with quite serious license um, restrictions. We've worked a couple of people with a couple of people in Inside Out Support Wales that have had um, quite serious license conviction convictions. Um, and actually, the internet can be quite democratizing for those individuals because they're able to set up businesses online. Nobody knows who they are. It's being done with the full knowledge of their support worker and they're able to, you know, earn a crust that way. So those sort of things need to be uh, taken into account. So I'm going to share with you another little film now, if that is OK. Um, and this is an example of someone's experience in a work environment from the prison uh, and sort of what it means to them pretty much in their own words. I, I really like this film, so I'm going to share with you this particular film once I can find it. Here we go. I'm inside of Tesco's with dry cleaning, shoe repairs, watch repairs, photo IDs. It's quite lonely when you're working by yourself, so you have to have that banter with the customers, you know. The start of this journey, uh, I, I, unfortunately, I was around the wrong type of people and um, got myself into a bit of a problem because I went to prison um, for armed robbery. I was a driver in the offence. And I just had a newborn baby. My baby was two months old and I had a six year old daughter and just gone like that over a bit of stupidity. Um, you know, all the prospects of getting a job when I'm coming out of there, it's just all going. I used to work before I used to work in a bank. I hadn't worked for a little while because I was pregnant, had my, my little boy. And what would I do after I came out of prison? I've now got an armed robbery offence, which doesn't look pretty. If I was an employer, it would, I, I wouldn't think that was, you know, a good, a good thing to give somebody a job who's an armed robber. 
I tried to occupy my time while I was in the prison. I used our education system. Um, you know, it's, it's quite daunting being in there. I know that I did something wrong and I had to be punished, but it does, you know, knock your confidence down a lot. I wanted to go to college and finish the hair and beauty course that had started within the prison, but you can't finish because they can only go to a certain level. At which time, Timpsons, I was told, were coming into the prison to interview. I'd never heard of Timpsons, to be honest. I, I've never cut a key. So I thought I'd go along to the interview anyway. I've got nothing to lose, I might as well go. Just a normal interview like you would have in any work environment, except what was really different for us and what um, relaxed me a little bit and let me be able to speak freely was the fact, the dreaded question of have you been to prison, what have you been to prison for? They didn't need to ask us that because they were in the prison. There was a lot of girls that went for them, two of us got picked, one of which was me. Um, I was so happy. I was at a stage in my sentence where I knew I was going to come out within the next year, year and a half. What am I going to do? I've been given this opportunity now um, that could be an opportunity of a lifetime. I don't want to go back into prison. I didn't want to be one of those people I saw coming in and out. I wanted to do right by my kids and my family and myself because that's who I'd hurt the most out of the the crime that I did and probably the lady that was involved in our crime as well you know I don't know how her life has been since then I got the job and I was going to leave the prison every day at six o'clock cut keys and come back into prison which is quite ironic really that I was leaving the prison to cut keys um, I passed all my levels one once within 12 weeks so that that is what they aim for in Timpsons um, so I was really pleased and when I left the prison, obviously I had to go to probation. Timpsons know that you have to go to probation and it's not a problem. It's not, I don't feel like, oh my goodness, I should be at work. They know how the system works. I'm not going to probation anymore, it's finished. All my sentence is finished, my probation is finished and I'm still at Timpsons um, and they've been really supportive. And I think without a job, it would have been really hard for me to fit back into society and not go back to the crowd that I'd been around to try and make money. Everybody's been fine with me and their attitude towards me being, of me being in prison. However, when I did first get the job, I called my friend outside and told her all about it, how, how great it was and everything. And she was a bit annoyed with me because she says, I can't get a job and I'm outside and you're in prison supposed to be doing a sentence and you're working and I can't get you. So there are people that are going to think well, like that. However, you've got that opportunity as well. You could approach the company and, you know, Timpsons don't have to employ from prison, but I think James has spotted a section um, of people that aren't even looked at um, because they are still in prison, they are still serving a sentence and so ordinarily nobody would look at you. It's nice belonging to something again and, and nice being able to fit in and not nice to work and show, show the kids that it doesn't have to be like this. You know, sometimes we make mistakes. I've made that mistake, I've learned by it and I've been given an, an, an opportunity and I've taken it and I feel that I'm doing really well and I'm not going to look back and I just hope that other people do do, other companies, small or big, you know, it, it will make a difference in the end if we all pull together, it will make a difference. There we go. I love that video. I love um, Susanna's story. It, I think you can see why she's in that, in that role as well. And um, Simpsons obviously are a sort of a gold standard when it comes to employing people straight out of prison. In, and, you know, um, even you know, whilst they're still in prison on, on, on license on Rottle. But I think you can see then really just from that film why they took her on. She's a real personable person. I've, I've only seen her in the films, but that, that comes across straight away. She talks right at the beginning about it being maybe a lonely place because you're working on your own. So right away, there's a level of trust there. And Timpsons, it's a, that's a whole different webinar. And I, if you're interested in what Timpsons do, I would urge you to look into 
and their sort of employment because it's really groundbreaking, very innovative. But you can tell you can tell her that she's got the skills that they want. You know, she's motivated, so she's got that personal reason why she wants to do it for her family. She's got fantastic communication skills. She's super duper personable. You know, I've done lots of interviews with people where they might give you sort of a, a one or a two word monosyllabic answer, but she's clearly not like that. She's really engaging as an individual. She also sees the bigger picture, you know, that conversation that she talks about there with her friend who who was a bit unhappy because she'd got the opportunity, but she'd not been to prison. And yet Susanna had been to prison and got this interview and got this uh, got this opportunity. I don't think it's as clear cut as that for me, for me because, you know, how many of us would say, I tell you what, you can have a job, but you've got to go into prison and not see your family and friends for a year, for two years. You probably wouldn't want to do that, would you? So, you know, she recognises that she, um, you know, that something terrible happened to her and she doesn't want to have that, that happen to her. She doesn't want that to happen to her again. So that's her story. Um, I really like it. I use Timpson's as an example of how things, you know, are as like a gold standard, how things are at the top. So um, uh, I, I like that example. And we're going to hear from James Timpson because he's talked about him there as well um, in a short period of time. So I shall get back to my slides. Okay, dokes. So there's, this next section is about direct support and how you can work with prisons and other organisations and sort of um, uh, you know different um, areas to work with ex-offenders, which hopefully will be of use to you. Um, if you are an organisation you're thinking about working with prisons, um, generally, you know, going through your governor or through your resettlement unit, they may have a partnership here in Wales. I've put quite a few different organisations in contact with New Futures Network uh, and for the eagle eyed of you, that was their click right at the beginning. The New Futures Network exists in, in England and Wales and they're, you know, about trying to bridge the gap. They do a lot of things, but one thing that they try and do is bridge the gap between sort of the, the world of employment, employers and uh, people coming out of prison. Um, so, you know, try and make contact with the governor or, you know, if you need to know who you're if you're in Wales, just give me a shout and I'll forward you on to Greg from the New Futures Network, most definitely. Um, if you are a business, try to be upfront and be honest with what you can offer. The relationship in terms of offering work placements, as placements has got to be a reciprocal arrangement. It's got to be right for the person coming to work with you. And similarly, it's got to be right the other way around as well. Of course, the prison is the, um, the common denominator in all of those conversations, but don't overpromise what you're able to do with what you're able to offer. You know, make sure that it's accurate. Um, if you're not sure, maybe you know, look at that sort of you know um, a, a time limited post. You know, so give somebody a three month placement and then review it after that. See how it goes. Um, I talked there about um, defining your prerequisite requirements for the role. So, you know, if you need someone who's got to have a level level two qualification in English and maths, say that. If you need someone who's got to have an industrial cleaning certificate, say that. If you need someone who's got to have their CSCS card, say that as well. That gives people an opportunity to work towards that qualification, that certification, because they know then that there's an opportunity on the other side of it. There's different arrangements for closed and open prisons, as I'm sure many of you know. So in closed prisons, um, the individuals aren't allowed to work during the day out of, out of the prison. They'll work in the prison, that's fine. There may be opportunities to link in with those prisons in terms of, from a prison industry's perspective, but generally employment opportunities, you're talking about things once those individuals have been released. In open prisons, it's a little bit different. You can work with the open prison to take um, individuals out of that prison um, you know, during the day to work with you. I, I set up a, a pipeline for um, prisoners to come out from HMP Prescoid in South Wales to go into um, Cardiff Met and work there, um, you know, doing a degree course. Um, essentially, they were just they were just the same as any other student, except they had a unique halls of residence at the end of the day. So, um, you know, open prisons have got a little bit more flexibility there in, in, in terms of what you can do. But again, it will be a reciprocal arrangement. Um, think about it this way as well and this is this comes back to some of the other webinars that i've been talking about this week is the existence of the previous conviction a genuine barrier to an employment opportunity um you know does it does someone need a dbs check 
um, does the uh, is all the information that you need actually forthcoming from the prison? Maybe it is. Yeah. You know, I would also say that keep your colleagues involved from a, from a business perspective. Keep your work colleagues involved in what you're thinking about doing. Some may have reservations. So some people may have had personal experience as victims of crime or family members may have. So they may have a completely different perspective um, than, you know, a manager or someone at the top of the business who's driving this forward or who's spearheading this. So I think that's important to bear in mind as well. There, You know, talk to your um, talk to your uh, your colleagues one of the other webinars i talked about risk there some companies like timpson's um their usp their unique selling point of their business is that link with people coming out of prisons for other industries it's less forthright um and part of that is because they're worried about the reputational risk that they may suffer to their competitors now, admittedly, Timpsons are basically buying up everyone <laughs> around. You know, they're a pretty, um, they're a pretty uh, 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 sort of what do you call them, uh, hungry business. You know, they, they, they've bought up plenty of their competitors. They've even bought Johnson's Dry Cleaning as well. So, you know, they're not averse to to going out there and swallowing up the competition. But other other companies, other businesses aren't like that, and they may be a little bit more risk averse. So that needs to be considered. To make to make it work with the uh, business. I would appoint, I would argue that you should try and give that person who's coming from the prison or coming straight, you know, if they're coming from an open prison or if they're, you know, newly released into the community and you're giving them a work, a work placement opportunity, give them a work buddy. Work buddy is nothing too fancy. You know, you might call it a mentor. You might, um, might call it, you know, a supervisor or whatever. But if you give them a work buddy, it's someone that, where, that they can ask, you know, where do I go for lunch? Where's the toilets? Where's the, where do I go for a fag break? Do I need to wear my high vis? All those sort of things, you know, that those like nuts and bolts things that you might be okay to ask if you go to, into a regular work environment. For someone coming out of prison, they may not know all those answers. So I think you've got a work buddy, someone who is seen more as a peer rather than a manager, that can help to um, ease their transition successfully into the business. Recognise as well that just like regular appointments, not every appointment will work out. That does happen. You know, plenty of people go into jobs and after a while they think, nah, this isn't for me. And then they decide to leave. I've done that myself. I've worked for a couple of places that I've thought, no, thanks. No, thanks. And I've, you know, I've decided to leave. So it's no reflection on the fact that they may have been in prison. It's just the fact that, 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 the, that the arrangement wasn't suitable for either party. So please do recognise that. Um, okay, I mentioned then about open and closed prisons. I'm sure most of you will. Um, closed prisons, um, they release men and women back into the community most of the time. They're category B and C prisons, whereas open prisons are often described as working prisons because nearly everybody works in that prison during the day. They're open prisons, they're category D. Most prisoners will go out to work on uh, during, the, during the day on stage one, which is a voluntary work placement, and then they'll generally work through to a stage two, which is a paid work placement. On, on rottle release on temporary license. And there's a lot of evidence out there to show that rottle is really effective in reducing reoffending. Essentially, it's a halfway house between prison and being fully released. It's sort of a, you know, a suitable transition um, into that particular area. If you are a business and they are, uh, and you have individuals who are gonna be working for you on rottle, uh, prisoners aren't subject to the national minimum wage but they are expected to be paid um, and they have similar terms and conditions of employment to anyone else, just like anyone doing the work. They'll um, also pay um, an amount of money back um, in terms of a victims of crime tax as well. So they get an additional tax until they're released. Payments aren't made directly to the person. Instead, they're paid into the, the HMPPS bank account for them. And often there's a service level agreement set up between the um, HMPPS and the placement provider. I've worked with those place with those um, uh, service level agreements before. They are one side of A4. They're not particularly onerous. It's just making sure that everything is covered. You know, really the 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 meat and uh, the meat and gravy of that relationship exists between the prison and the you know the placement or the work provider. So you know that you, that people know that. Um, there are uh, contacts in both areas so that if something needs to be discussed or something goes wrong, the relevant people have got the right contact details. 
Also, it's important to mention that in terms of Rothel, people worry um, in the prison, um, sorry, not in the prison, um, in the business or the work placement provider, that um, they've got to be the eyes and ears, so making sure that the prison isn't doing something that they're not supposed to. Ultimately, it's up to the prisoner to keep the terms of, of, of their Rottle license. I would say from experience, just make sure that they've got it on them all the time. Because if, um, if the spot check, hack, spot check, my teeth back in, if a spot check happens and someone from the prison comes up to make sure that this person that they are sending up to you on Rottle is where they're supposed to be, is where they've said they're going to be, um, they'll also ask to see their papers, their Rottle papers, and they'll, they should have them to show them straight away. So that's quite important. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples of um, good practice and innovation. Now I'm going to show you the final video. Um, and this is James Timpson, and he's talking about why they decided to work um, with prisons and ex-offenders. My first example of repairing shoes wasn't too far from here. It was in Cannon Street. I'd left school, I was on my gap year, and I was sent to go and run the shops in London. Every shop I went into, I tripled the turnover. The first thing I did is I put all the money in the till. That doubled the turnover. <laughs> that was quite a simple way of doing things. And the other thing, because I was the boss's son and I was quite naive, I could break all the rules. I didn't really know what the rules were. So I could order whatever stock I wanted. I could do deals. I went to university. Then I came back into the business. And that's when I really started to work at what sort of business do I want to work in? What is the culture that I want my colleagues to be working in? So I decided to look around to see what other people did. And it occurred to me there were some sort of different cultures that I could pick. The one that I feel, felt very comfortable with was the, sort of the, the John Lewis type culture where you, everybody's a colleague, everybody's treated equally. So I was pretty clear that I wanted to run the business by treating everybody as an equal and have a long-term view. And I decided what, we, what was actually the most important thing was those colleagues, we do colleagues, not staff, very important, our colleagues who serve customers and put money in the till are the most important people in the business. They can do whatever they want to serve customers the way they see fit. So many organisations have so many rules, processes, guidelines in place to stop the 5% of idiots being an idiot. But the problem is the 95% of the wonderful people in the business also have to abide by these rules. So we have two rules. The first is you put the money in the till. And the other is you act the part. Which common sense things, you turn up on time, you're nice, you're kind, you're polite, and the rest, you can do whatever you like. You can charge whatever you like. You can order whatever stock you want. You can do displays however you wish. We even have a shop that's painted pink because the manageress in Faversham likes pink. But the real problem with our business 20 years ago was there were lots of people working in it who weren't that great. So the lesson I learned is I want to recruit wonderful people, but I need to look after them. So what do I mean by looking after them? Everybody wants to work in a business that you feel valued. So again, I went around and borrowed ideas off other companies, changed the way it works. So for example, if you work for us, everybody gets their birthday off as an extra day off. If you get married, we provide you a wedding car and a driver for the wedding and you get an extra week off and flowers for the wedding. What we like to do is to help our colleagues outside work because we know what a difference it makes to them when they're in work. We have a very simple way of recruiting. It's all about personality. We look at your CV and we're only looking for two things. What's your name and what's your phone number? We aren't interested in anything else. If I'm really honest, if you've been a shoe repairer before, we probably really don't want you. We want people who've got no experience, but they've got experience of life. Because we only want people who are fun, interesting, engaging, look you in the eye, they've got a buzz about them. When I was invited to go to um, a local prison in Warrington, near where I live, I thought it would be a great opportunity to go inside and have a look. Because um, when I was younger, sort of seven, eight years old, my parents fostered children. And my parents used to specialise, it was my mum, really, who did most of it, um, used to specialise in babies. So there's a, a women's prison in style, um, just by Manchester Airport. And I used to go there to take the babies to go and see the mum. Because I was too young, I was never allowed the other side of the wall, so I was always interested to go um, the other side to, to see what went on. I remember turning up, and this young lad, one of the inmates, 19 years old, gave me a tour around. Exactly the sort of personality that I wanted. Buzzy, lively, fun, interesting, engaging. Had a chat with him, never been to prison before. 
So I slipped in my business card and said, listen, when you're out, give me a ring and I'll give you a job. To cut a long story short, he's still with us now. So I thought, if I can get people like Matthew, who then goes into the shops and is really good, why can't I get some more? So I went around more prisons. At the time, I didn't tell anybody in the business what I was doing. I set my goal of 10 ex-offenders, or as we call them in our business, foundation colleagues. I recruited some absolutely fantastic people. I also recruited some tricky people, who at the time I thought I could solve, I could fix it. Um, so I paid people's drug dealers off, and I gave people you know, more than nine lives that kept going and going. Um, and it got to the stage where I had one colleague who was sort of fighting his corner a lot until he punched a customer um, and then tried to burn down the shop. And I thought, no, I need to, I need to sort of uh, get this sorted. So I worked harder and harder going to more and more prisons, interviewing more and more people. I don't recruit sex offenders because in our shops we take photos of children and adults, part of our ID photo business. And there are a number of people in prison who are actually not well enough to work having a job would be the worst thing that could happen to them. So I, I see myself as recruiting from about a third of the prison population. My ideal prisoner is 23, 24 years old, preferably a woman, and they have a hook on the outside. So they've got kids, they've got a, a relationship they want, they've got a reason that they want to get out and do normal. They're fed up of chaos. So I'm just going to come on, just as I finish, to prison reform. And some of you will have read in the papers recently that um, sentiment has changed, and even politicians recognise that we can't keep going on locking up 85,000 people tonight, knowing that over 50% of them will be back in again within a year, and uh, hardly any of them will manage to find work. We need fewer people in prison. Compliant prisoners need to be released early. And, prison, and prisons need to be better run. But we need to significantly improve education. You know, we need to help our prisoners um, get qualifications so they can get a job. Um, we have a health service that makes us better, we have an education system that teaches us, we have a defence service that keeps us safe, and we have a prison system that seems to keep us going back to prison, and that can't be right. So I'm hoping, as many of you may well be as well, that the future will be fewer prisons, but better prisons, and those people who do leave prison will have an opportunity to live a normal, fulfilling life, and hopefully companies like mine will be fortunate to have them serving you every day of the week. There we are. I'll turn off the funky, uh, the funky um, music at the end, the outro there. <clears throat> I really like that video um, from uh, from uh, James Simpson talking about how how basically you know he's he's made that their uh, USP of how it works. I think it's really effective. I think what he shows there is that he acknowledged that you know in the early days he made mistakes. Um, I love that story about how he paid off people with drug dealers. That's quite interesting. Um, but I think it's really really useful to talk about you know and to see from his example that you know basically how he did it. So uh, yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's quite a, a useful a, a useful um, film to watch, I think. And like I said, at the end, we've got all of these in the uh, slides, so hopefully that's been useful, yeah. I'm glad you liked the, the video. Thank you, Lorraine. Thank you, Joanna, for your comments. Yeah, he is a really useful person to watch. Um, can you get a job in Simpsons? Then give him a shout. Why not? Why not? <laughs> yeah. If you do, um, remember us. And, uh, and, and remember to say that it all started from a webinar that you, that you were attending with Voices of Experience um, inside Out Sport Wales. <laughs> um, but I'm sure we wouldn't be able to, to claim any of the credit really. Okay, just go back to the slides. Um, okay, so I talk about that in, in innovation and good practice really, and that's particularly important really for me. Um, you know, I think it's, 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 it's really quite quite important in terms of um, how we can help people there. And um, think about this, think about it from a corporate social responsibility perspective. So uh, business in the community, they run a ban the box campaign and that calls on UK employees to give offenders a fair chance um, to go for jobs. And basically they, re they remove the tick box from the application form. Um, and if they do ask about criminal convictions, it's much later in the process. Why is it that important that it's much later in the application process? Because what you tend to see is that people will um, see the word conviction and go, mm, 
no, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll give up. That used to be the case when universities, um, when people were applying to university with a conviction, I think the question about convictions was literally one of the first questions that they uh, asked. The, first, the question about convictions was one of the first questions that they asked and people would give up then, even though you know they may be given a, a fair crack of the whip. So, um, you know, if they do ask it, it's going to be much later in, in, in the application process. See Potential, which is the UK government's campaign, and they basically tried to show how a few simple changes to the, recruit, to the recruitment process can make a real difference to rec recruit people from all kinds of backgrounds. Um, the C Potential campaign isn't just ex-offenders. It's got a few other uh, sort of priority areas too. Um, they're also ex-offenders, homeless people, care leavers, people who are homeless um, or at risk of homelessness, people who've been long-term unemployed, people recovering from an addiction, um, single parents, and also some military veterans. So it's a very inclusive campaign. Um, I've Googled the hashtag um, uh, see potential to see how many companies actually have signed up for that particular campaign that the UK government have. I'll be honest with you, I haven't seen that many. I'm happy to be proved wrong. Um, I list it here because uh, the Ministry of Justice told me to, um, but I haven't seen that many um, people who've actually signed up for it. But like I say, I'm happy to be proved wrong. However, their resources are really useful so i've included their resources here um, and they are in uh, with a lot of the information that i'm going to be giving you today so i mentioned about the support so i'm going to um leave you with the last couple of slides before we take a few questions so the um the benefits of employing ex-offenders link at the top of your screen there that particular link is um is a full of really useful stuff and it's also the up-to-date section from the ministry of justice mainly from the new futures network there's a new futures network which is different in wales excuse me but it pretty much follows the same sort of path it's just got a separate identity um that meant that article that i talked about how and um, the how there are business benefits for recruiting ex-offenders. I put the link in there from Personnel Today. So that's an HR uh, magazine. It's not, you know, Jamie Grundy's, you know, sort of cherry pick this off the internet somewhere. It's actually an HR magazine. So I think that's important to read. I put the link there to Ban the Box, how you can use, you know, Ban the Box campaign to remove the criminal records um, tick box. I'm going to talk about that. Um, uh, the Let's have a look. I'm going to give the, um, what does it say? I'm just reading Philippa's point then. So anything about the government scheme for the, for the civil service? You're asking about Philippa. I do know that in the ban the box link from business in the community, it's got a direct link into the civil service. So it might, fingers crossed, touch wood and all that, it might take you straight in there. Um, but if not, if that doesn't take you in there, drop me a line and I'll see if I can find out for you. The civil service are one of the ban the box employers. I think that's great because it's showing that the government are um, walking the walk, not just talking the talk. Um, and also, just think about it. You know, the civil service has got some great terms and conditions, whether it comes to you know uh, parental leave, whether it comes to um, um, sort of sickness leave, whether it comes to um, uh, what's it called um, sort of pension rights and things like that. Some really good benefits there. Um, what I would say is there are two links on there that I think can be taken together. So I mentioned this link for one of the other webinars that I do, which is Glassdoor. So Glassdoor is an online recruitment agency, if you will. I can't remember who it's owned by. It might be Indeed, but I'm not 100% sure. But what marks Glassdoor out from any of the, of the other online um, recruitment platforms is that... Um, you are encouraged to interact with you and upload things like interview questions. So, yeah, you can find out a lot about a company, um, vacancies and who's recruiting, et cetera, and you can apply through it. But people upload their interview questions. Now, for example, if you look at the band the box links, you'll see some employers there. If you're able to, if you're, if you're thinking about applying for work there and you make a really good application because you know they're not, you know they're a ban the box employer, so you're going to get a fair crack at a whip. Then you get shortlisted for interview. By going to Glassdoor, you can look up that company and you can search not only by locale, but you can search by job title and you can find the sort of 
interview questions that they're going to be asking you. So that's great. So that's, you know, that's giving you a really strong steer of what you're going to be asked to interview. So that's worthwhile having a look at there. Um, I've mentioned the C Potential campaign, so I've put the link up there, which gives you all of the C Potential priority ideas. Um, I've got some information on Rottle, um, some evidence relating to the impact of reducing reoffending through um, the Rottle release of temporary license um, process. I've got a link there to Unlock, who I've mentioned a few times before in previous webinars. They support people with convictions. If you're interested in doing um, uh, any reports in this particular field or you need to sort of um, look at the impact of, say, employment on criminal justice, then by all means, um, have a look at the Bromley briefings. They're done on a quarterly basis um, and they're really good in terms of getting data of all the sector that you can use for reports. Uh, finally, the Hardman Trust have, or oh, I haven't got the Hardman Trust directory with me. They produce annually a great big directory of support services for prisoners and ex-offenders. There's generally one in prison. It's always a limited print run. It's hard to get hold of. However, go to that link on the website. You can download it on your phone or on a tablet, and suddenly you've got a ton of stuff on there. There we are. See, going in there, having a little look at stuff. I'm making this work. How do we get on? There we are. How to help. So there's loads of stuff in there. You can download the app there. And just before we um, I hand back over to any questions with you, I'm going to share some things with you. So first of all, I'm going to share with you the slides from today. I'm going to share uh, with you, I don't know if you've got anybody here from the Forward Trust, but I'm going to share with you a report from them, which is called Bridging the Gaps, which is a really good report in terms of the employability of ex-offenders. And finally, I'm going to um, share with you the up-to-date guide from New Futures Network from the Ministry of Justice, like an, an offender employment guide. That's the one that they wanted me to share with you. They um, they, they uh, virtually smacked my hand um, when uh, when, I, when they asked me if I was uh, distributing that that uh, that report through the webinar, and I wasn't doing before, so so that's there. That's all there for you. So download those if you wish to, please. Um, and then you'll get an email in a couple of weeks' time, uh, in a couple of hours' time, sorry, with a link to view this webinar again. Always drop me a line if there's any more training you'd like to do. And that, I do believe, is the end of the slides for the webinar. So um, if you want to put anything in the chat that you'd like to know, any questions, please do so. Um, I'm going to give a quick shout out for our webinar for tomorrow, our final webinar um, that we have tomorrow, because we've been doing webinars all week. My eyes are virtually square, even though I haven't led all of them. I've generally been in the background doing them. So we've got, um, we've got one more tomorrow which is uh, 10 till 12, and it's uh, all about effective disclosure. So I will put that link in the chat there. So if you're interested in doing that, um, click on there and get yourself booked in. That'll be fine. I appreciate that. Um, and, yeah, thank you very much for your time today. I hope the Voices of Experience webinars have been useful for you. Feel free to tweet away. Use the hashtag Voices of Experience um, and tag us at Kefanogaith. Um, in anything at, um, or oh, the word Kevin Ogaith means support in Welsh. As you can tell from my uh, accent, I'm, I, I'm, I'm not from Wales originally, I'm from the north of England, but um, I'm improving my Welsh language skills a little bit. So yeah, tag us in anything. And if there's any questions, please pop them in the chat. What I'll do is I will turn my mic off, turn my photo off, and I'll be online here for the next 15 minutes. So if you've got a question that you want to ask me, pop it in the chat. You should always, you can, you can, not you should, you can, if you want to, send a private message as well, um, if you wish to. So that's absolutely fine. Thank you, Joanna. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Aaron. Very grateful. So I shall, I shall bid you adieu, as they say, in uh, The Sound of Music. And I shall look forward to seeing you tomorrow on our final webinar. But once again, a great big thank you to everyone for joining us today. Um, and I look forward to seeing you on the other Voices of Experience webinars. Thank you very much. Jock and bye.